Dr. Zoe Opacic is an architectural historian with a focus on Gothic architecture in Central Europe. She completed her PhD at the Courtauld Institute of Art with Professor Paul Crossley before becoming a lecturer at the History of Art Department at Birkbeck College. In 2015, Zoe received the prestigious Leverhulme Research Fellowship to work on her next book project, Architecture and Spectacle in the Late Medieval City, which focuses on Prague, Vienna and Krakow. She has also published extensively on Gothic architecture in Bohemia, on medieval cities and urbanism, and on the relationship between architecture and ritual. Zoe, thanks so much for being here. It's a pleasure to come. <laughs> I'm so excited to chat about architecture today as we get ready to open our Architecture and Ornament show. Um, now, the pieces in our show, some of which you can see behind us, uh, come from a variety of contexts and also a variety of time periods. Their journey to get into private collections was different in each case. Some of them were removed from buildings that no longer exist now. Some were removed from buildings that were under restoration. One of the pieces that we have, the Canterbury piece, was actually removed quite recently because of the structural integrity of the building. I think the point is that all of these pieces come from a much wider context and they're all from a larger story. And so I thought having this chat with you, we would be able to bring some of that story alive I can't say that we'll be able to talk about the entire story of medieval architecture, but some of it, I hope. It's a big subject. <laughs> yeah, it is a big subject, isn't it? We can at least start. Um, and I thought we could just jump straight into it and start by talking about the general shape of churches. Um, and so I thought it'd be nice if you could walk us through um, the parts of a Gothic church. Or a medieval church. Yes, that's, uh, that's an excellent idea. Uh, as you say, we see things here slightly more piecemeal, but if we try to imagine an ideal building, and it would have to be an ideal building because, of course, even big churches were very different, uh, different shapes, but also depending on where they were, their internal arrangements were also somewhat different. So an ideal uh, church might be a basilica, a longitudinal building, and if we start from outside, perhaps the most um, imposing thing that it would be aware of is the west facade, uh, usually arranged as a sort of twin tower facade with um, portals that lead into the building, normally three to reflect the internal arrangement of the building itself. Now, over time, the arrangement of that facade would have differed in height and in complexity, number of windows, where they might have had a rose window, a circular window with lots of tracer inside. So that would be the kind of public face of the building. It's not necessarily the one you enter. Uh, sometimes you would enter through side portals too, but it would be the most public um, face of the building and most heavily sculpted and decorated. Once you're inside, in our imaginary longitudinal building, which is based on a basilica, you would find yourself probably in the nave, which is the area reserved for the public, for the laity. Um, you probably wouldn't get the kind of uninterrupted longitudinal view all the way to the east as we do when we visit cathedrals today. Uh, but you would get the sense of height and length. And alongside that main nave, that central vessel, uh, you would see also to uh, your uh, left and right, or to the south and north, side aisles, equally longitudinal, uh, flanking aisles to the, to the main nave. There could be one on each side, or sometimes there are two, as in St. Peter's in Rome, for example, and that's often copied. As you progress down the nave, uh, you would arrive at another key point of the building. Now, this is something different in Christian churches from their predecessor basilicas in classical uh, time. And there will be a transverse vessel called a transept, which primarily allows you to enter the building from different points. It also creates a rather dramatic crossing over which a tower could be built, or, for example, in Italian churches, uh, a dome. And then from here, you uh, progress into the most important part of the building, the kind of eastern arm, where the altar, the main altar is. And now the arrangement of this part could differ in different uh, contexts, but normally it would be an apsidal um, structure with perhaps a kind of ambulatory uh, an area where you can walk around the altar and access other parts of the east end. 
So this is the kind of basic shape. Now that gets more complicated once you start to break it down because there might be axial chapels coming out of the ambulatory, there may be further side chapels in the nave, especially in the later Middle Ages, those tend to proliferate. Uh, there will be also screens, main screens between the east and the west part of the building, also some smaller screens separating, for example, the choir from the ambulatory and so on. So, you know, it is quite a complex, uh, almost city-like arrangement, which is meant to cater for a number of functions. But that gives you a kind of mm. basic sense of the layout yeah. of a, a, a kind of imaginary great church. Mm. And in, in some of these um, English cathedrals, um, you have chapter houses or lady chapels as well. That I just want to bring that in because we have a piece of um, the chapter house from York Minster. And so that's quite interesting as well, because when you look at that ground plan, it just looks like this almost alien structure, you know, coming off of the... And what a chapter yeah. house that yeah. is. And it's very <laughs> amazing to have that kind of... Uh, almost fully preserved, including some of its stained glass. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is a very good point. Of course, the function of the building influences greatly their internal liturgical arrangement. In England, we have this particular situation that cathedrals are often coupled with monasteries. And so these transepts also allow entrance to uh, the chapter as opposed to the bishop or the archbishop, the city, as opposed to canons and so on. So the whole circulation around the building and also keeping these groups of people separate from one another is very important. In addition to that, these important other functions like chapter house or cloister and so on. Uh, so yes, you're absolutely right. I think that these are in England as well from 13th century onwards, lady chapels are positioned quite often at the end of Eastern Arm, which creates further problems about allowing laity to access them while not interfering with uh, monastic services that go on in the choir um, and regular hours. So yes, it's very, very complex, very kind of multifunctional space. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you touched on this already a little bit, but um, in terms of going back to this general shape, where does that derive from and does it change uh, in the Middle Ages? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, the sense of tradition rather than rupture is very important in history of art. I think we understand that more and more. So here the tradition goes back to an earlier period that would be early Christian and before that Roman architecture. Uh, and the difference is that basilicas existed in Roman period. Um, some of them still survive today. We can see them as ruins on the Palatine in Rome, or we can see them actually as functioning churches like the one in Trier. But they were secular buildings. The advantage of them is they could hold a large number of people, but they also gave that important focal point. And in churches, you need that too. You need to have a large body to allow people to uh, access uh, the church and the mass. But you also need that focal point in, uh, in the form of the altar and the priest uh, performing sacraments at the altar. So the, the, the function has changed dramatically. Actually, the basic shape is the same. And of course, as we just you know, explained, uh, it becomes more complex with the addition of transepts and so on, ambulatories. But that, that basic form of the, of the basilica is a Roman inheritance. And why do you think that we as art historians focus so much on church architecture rather than secular architecture? I think for a lot of people, when they think of medieval, they think of castles. Yes, that's and, and scholars probably think more well, yeah. of churches, and maybe that's not uh, entirely fair. I, I Interestingly, I quite often try to explain it to my students, uh, and I suppose there is no justification of prioritizing church architecture over secular architecture, especially something as uh, complex as a medieval castle. What I would say by way of some sort of defense is that churches have a, a continuous use. So we can follow a history of the building uh, from the very beginning. That does not mean that it's not being changed. In fact, most of them has, have undergone a, a tremendous change and look very different from how they were conceived. Um, so, but they are there and uh, it's also their scale. Um, complexity, the fact that so many of them survive, sadly secular architecture has not fared so well, which means that we can compare them regionally within the same country, internationally and so on. So we can get a better sort of sense of narrative by doing that uh, than we can with um, trying to uh, 
piece together domestic architecture in the same period, for example. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to do all these things, but I think there is some uh, justification in focusing on churches in trying to kind of understand the development of medieval architecture. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to just talk a little bit about style. Um, mm. And although it feels like some of my questions following on from here are all about style, but um, I want to start with um, our very dear Paul Crossley. Oh. In one of his lectures, um, he defined Gothic by referring to something actually that Eric Fernie said um, mm. in his book about Romanesque. In that if you think about Romanesque as a style defined by massive but separate parts, then mm. Paul thought that Gothic could be defined as, a uni as the unification of delicate parts. Um, how do you define Romanesque versus that's a Gothic? Lovely, that's a lovely quote, and typically for Paul Crossley, it really kind of gets to the heart of understanding what, how things are. I think it's important to talk about style, and in fact, if you look at the, these lovely, uh, wonderful objects that you have here, it's uh, impossible to place them without understanding stylistic development of a certain period. And, uh, you know, to understand the difference between buildings, say, at the beginning of the 12th century or at the end, I think it's important to be able to read their individual elements, shape of capital, molding profiles, these sort of stone matrices uh, or shape of a column and so on. But, you know, there are more than just some of those parts. It's the overall effect that is very important. I think this is possibly what Paul Crossy was getting at. Uh, Paul Frankel also talked about frontality of Romanesque buildings versus diagonality of Gothic uh, buildings. They're meant to be kind of walked around and understood slightly differently. There's certainly a sense that buildings are becoming, in their separate elements, more fused together, also easier to read and more integrated from bottom to the top, or to, you know, from the floor level to the keystone or the other way around. They're easy to read that way. In fact, if you look at the French Gothic Cathedral, I think it's fair to say that if you understand a single bay, you can almost repeat that as a mm. unit throughout. But ultimately, they are trying to achieve slightly different things. Things have moved on a little bit. Um, it's not just about height. I mean, I, I think it's really totally unfair to say that Roman build, Romanesque buildings are small and Gothic are very, ones are very large, especially in England, uh, Gothic buildings are quite often the, exactly the same height as their Norman predecessors. But the quest for light, uh, the technical ability which enable masons to build buildings which are big on glass and small on stone, more decorative in the way they treat stone, uh, create a different impression. So it's not just about the height, it's also about the light and the general perception of lightness of these structures, which is enabled by this amazing advances in technical engineering. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, whereas we don't, we shouldn't be too categorical in pacing things in their little boxes. Um, I think it, it, we will all agree that when, if we walk into saint Etienne at Caen and Reims Cathedral, we'll have a different impression of that building. Yeah. And actually to stay on that, one of the things um, that a lot of people say and assume is that Gothic always means more. Hmm. Now that means more uh, technology, more height, more hmm. complexity, more ornament. But that's not necessarily true, is it? Well, like lots of um, uh, oversimplifications, it, it has some ring of truth. Um, if you stand in front of the west facade of Reims Cathedral, I think complexity is the word where it comes straight to your mind. But you know, if we look at some of the early examples that we have here, we see there is no shortage of ornamentation. Uh, I think bigger buildings allow for more carving uh, around portals, something that's already been happening in Romanesque buildings, if we think of those in the south of France, especially around portals. Um, but here, sculpture becomes more integrated into the overall architectural design. And that integration happens at all levels, not just between different zones of the building, but also between windows and facades, uh, vaults, stone vaults and their rib uh, designs and so on. So I think you do get that sense of complexity, but also even Gothic style, there is a reaction to that depending 
on institutions, monastic orders that commissioned them. The studies started to try to pull back from that. Um, there is a style in, in late Gothic period called uh, reduced Gothic, Reduzions Gothic in German, that also aims to sort of uh, step back from that. But I think if you look at the tracery and window design, vault design, certainly complexity is, mm -hmm. is the aim. One of the most interesting aspects of Gothic, I think, is that transition between Romanesque to Gothic. I wondered if you could talk about one building that's usually mm. um, used to start a conversation of the birth of Gothic. So many scholars will agree that there is a particular building which combines many aspects of what is now known as Gothic, and that is uh, the Abbey of Saint-Denis in Paris. So this is not a cathedral, it's a monastic church, but it's uh, a very special uh, monastery because of its connections with the French royal uh, house. And under Abbot Suger in the middle of the 12th century, it was rebuilt piecemeal, starting from its uh, west end, the facade and the entrance bay, the kind of narthex, and then moving uh, shortly after to the east end. And it's this east end that is particularly interesting for us. Uh, what makes it Gothic is that it combines, combines many aspects of Gothic architecture, such as recognizable ones, such as the pointed arch, rib vault probably, uh, and also quite large windows. Uh, and these pointed arches and ribs are very consistently used at Saint-Denis in the way they were not used even subsequently in buildings that followed it and imitated it in some way. It also its layout, which consists of an apsidal choir, uh, an ambulatory and polygonal radiating chapels, kind of comprising of a chevet, as, as it's known in French uh, literature. So uh, Saint-Denis is probably the first truly Gothic building. Another aspect of Saint-Denis that is interesting is this focus of light, and that is really connected with theological writing, which was connected to the Abbey. And um, scholars like Erwin Panofsky uh, in the 20th century sought connection between certain visual and aesthetic aspects of Saint-Denis and a particular cult that is the cult of Saint Denis or Saint Denis in the Abbey and try to see that uh, theological explanation for the sort of architecture that emerges in this building. So that royal connection, theological uh, um, strand that may be not as strong as Panofsky thought and technical uh, achievement which creates this visually aesthetically very distinctive building is what makes Saint-Denis very special. Now we have to unpick this a little bit and to say following scholars like Christopher Wilson and many others who pointed out that certain elements of Saint-Denis were current in France before. Um, Norman architecture in the north uh, of France used revolts uh, before. Burgundian architecture started uh, developing uh, uh, buildings around the idea of uh, uh, pointed arches especially those uh, used by Cistercian orders. And in Paris itself, which at this time was becoming real centre of France, cultural, political, administrative centre, uh, starts building thin wall buildings. So really playing around with that sense of uh, thickness, depth and height. So the kind of elements of Gothic and uh, technical know-how was uh, already kind of current in France before Saint-Denis, but they seem to come together beautifully like a sunset uh, in this very church. And because of its status, it's very influential. Many people come to its consecration in 1144, and the kind of uh, echo uh, is uh, apparent very immediately in the decades to follow in uh, France, in northern France, but also subsequently in England in buildings like Canterbury Cathedral from 1170s onwards. Mm. So Saint-Denis it is, but uh, again, with some caveats. Yeah, and this, uh, this question might relate to Saint-Denis, it might not, depending mm. on the argument that you um, follow. But can you name one um, new technology that was developed by the Gothic architects? Well, obviously, the main challenge in Gothic buildings is this uh, interest in buildings of greater height uh, had to be underpinned by a technical knowledge of how to make heavy stone stand up. And obviously the, the introduction of large windows uh, amplified that, that difficulty. Stone vaults too exert pressure and perhaps 
One particular uh, innovation is the flying buttress. It's something that we all immediately notice as we walk around Gothic cathedrals. Now, architects have tried to resolve this tension between having heavy stone vaults and high buildings with heavily glazed triforia and clerestories by using various techniques within the building to create a kind of um, support or a counter thrust. Um, one of them is called tar de charge and is to do with the arrangement of ribs around the vault. The other uh, is the false bearing technique, which is really about distribution of weight in the gallery level. But none of this could quite resolve that tension in, in Gothic structures. So ultimately, flying buttresses allow buildings to grow higher. They didn't just conduct weight of the vaults downwards into the ground, but also created a kind of counter thrust because they're also made out of stone. So the trick was to create a kind of interlocking system between this internal pressure uh, and, and the buttresses themselves. And this is a bit of a trial and error. So earlier Gothic buildings, uh, around 1200 and a little bit earlier, uh, are building very large, very heavy uh, flying buttresses. Gradually, they become more confident. You can see that progression actually very well in Chartres Cathedral uh, between the nave, which was built earlier, and its choir. So the nave ones are closer together, they're very heavy, they're not particularly decorative, they look like walls. The ones around the choir are slimmer, they're managing to work around the polygony of the choir, uh, they're more decorative altogether. But quite how you connect the flying buttresses in the building was one of the main key challenges for architects in the Middle Ages. So perhaps that one amongst many others. So talking about ar architects, um, we have a lot of pieces in this show and for most of them um, we don't know who the patron was. But when it comes to the masons or the designers that built the buildings that the pieces come from, we have even less knowledge. And so I want to talk a little bit about the status of the architect in the Middle Ages or the master mason. Mm. Um, towards the later Middle Ages, we know a little bit more. And for me, um, the 13th century is a sort of a transition. I don't know what you think, but um, I always think of the middle of the 13th century and those moralized Bibles that are um, produced for Louis IX, especially the frontispieces where God is creating the world and he's bent over with his compass like an architect, like a divine architect creating the world which I think for me was sort of always a symbol of this transition. Now, I don't know what you think. Does the status of the Master Mason change mm -hmm. from the early Middle Ages towards the later Middle Ages? Yes, I think there is a shift. I mean, there's also a shift in evidence in what we know about these uh, men. And I think that we're largely talking about men. There are no great women Masons. Um, so, uh, Yes, I think there's also a question of evidence and what we know about the men who build these uh, extraordinary buildings. As the um, complexity of the buildings grows, especially in 13th century France, uh, uh, the status of the master mason uh, also changes. We see that we have uh, more evidence of who they were, we have their names in accounts. Uh, we also have in some of the buildings, such as for example Chartres Cathedral, and at Amiens, we have um, labyrinths uh, drawn into the floor. Some survive and some are known just from the records. Uh, and this refers to the myth of Daedalus. So there is a sort of sense of here of great uh, innovation and achievement, but also slightly of hubris. Um, later in the Middle Ages, we not only know their names, we know their families, their set up businesses, they are very good uh, businessmen. Um, they work on more than one site. Uh, they are invited because of their fame and the kind of drawings that they possess, their experience uh, to different sites, either as advisors or to actually work. So we know names such as Anton Pilgrim or Peter Parler and the Parler family, Parler clan, are one of the most influential in the later Middle Ages. The Ramses in England and so on. So, we know more about them, about their contracts, about their methods of work, about their workshops and the organizational workshops, um, which, and also the fact they're often buried in the buildings which they constructed, Hugh Lebergi in San Niquez or Peter Paul and Matthew of Arras in Prague Cathedral and so on, means that their position has grown in society generally. Um, 
I mean, that is not surprising, not just because what they were able to do and the kind of experience they accumulated between different building sites and projects, um, but also the kind of workshops they commanded. I mean, these are large sites with a lot of different uh, skills involved, a lot large number of men. Um, so I think there is, I think there's certainly some truth in that, yes. Mm. No, I agree, and especially with Peter Parler, who's mm. so close to our hearts, um, who was the master mason of Prague Cathedral. Um, he, um, as you mentioned in a previous discussion we had, has his bust you know, up there in the triforium That's with right, the royal yes. family, which is, yeah. I mean, yeah. unthinkable. He's a member Even of the today. court, <laughs> yes, he is a member of the court. Um, so not just buried next, very close to the emperor himself, but he was also included among the important people who are kind of on the periphery of the royal court. So that is quite uh, quite special. But Peter Parler is very unique and his successors, members of his family then continued to work on in Vienna, um, in places as far as Basel and advising in Milan and so on. So um, also the particular style of architecture that he uh, created in or had an opportunity to create in Prague because it was such an important uh, site. It was, Prague was the center of the Holy Roman Empire in the 14th century um, and working alongside or for a very eccentric patron uh, created a very, very unusual building that breaks many canons of traditional Gothic design. And, and it's it, seen as a kind of transition, isn't it? From that's right. From the high Middle Ages to what we consider... Exactly. He does for architecture what Wagner does for, for modern music, I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, architecture doesn't look the same. Uh, in terms of individual motifs, shapes of tracery, and so on, many of these things existed before because his roots go back on the, um, to the Rhenish architecture and also Southern German. So it's not coming out of nowhere, but nonetheless combined in this way, in, in this really important building, it makes its mark. Uh, perhaps most significantly in the way he uses individual segments of designs and spins them off, plays with them, not as a part of a structure in the way the French architecture does, but vaults, tracery designs, towers and portals can all be treated individually as little sh or large showpieces and combine in the way or designed in the way that we haven't seen before. So you can have a mosaic. Uh, above a portal main entrance into the cathedral rather than more traditional portal sculpture. But that's because it faces the royal palace and the city beyond and because Charles IV traveled widely in Italy and was uh, crowned in Rome and so on. So there are ideological reasons why this is done. But Peter Parler had that flexibility and equal uh, kind of level of imagination when he approached his structures and was able to feed or to kind of respond to Charles IV's demands. I think that in particular, that uh, freedom to create and to be innovative um, is, is something that uh, uh, became very influential and we see that in Vienna and beyond. Yeah. Mm. And when we think of this, this sort of the start of this period, late Gothic, and you know, in which sort of then rolls on into the 15th, 16th centuries, 16th centuries even. Exactly, yeah. um, I think when we think of Central Europe and Germany, we often think of these incredible spires that are there, such complex yes. structures. Mm. Um, now, I wonder if you could tell us what they were used for. So we started with our imaginary cathedral and talked about walking through the West End or West Work, which usually combined two towers. I think no, traditionally there were bell towers. Uh, and sometimes they even had a, a defensive uh, role. Um, I think increasingly they became a kind of civic symbol of civic pride. Um, it was a way in which you could recognize a city if you think about arriving into one of these great Baltic cities in the north and seeing some of its churches from the far off. Um, they're also become a kind of virtuoso pieces for masons uh, to design. They're very complex. I mean, Robert Bork uh, has written extensively about the complexity of their geometry and so on. They're very expensive to build, which is which is why we quite often have um, asymmetrical tower designs. One finished, for example, in Chartres in the 13th century, the other in the beginning of the 16th century and so on. Uh, they are quite often left unfinished. So I think you are right that they are very kind of, they're showpieces and quite often ways in which masons could, through their drawings and design, uh, present to the patrons what they were able to do. 
um, quite often they began in one way and they were finished in another way. Sometimes they were not completed at all. So many of the famous towers, I can think of Bern or Cologne Cathedral, the west facade of Prague Cathedral, were only completed in the late 19th and 20th century, quite often using drawings that survived in workshops, but which have been almost invariably changed by the time they were completed. So uh, they have many functions, but I think by the end, yes, they're really showing off what architects could do to and what city could afford. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that you mentioned, which is quite interesting, is the fact that the, we know of no kind of incredible women architects that were around in the Middle Ages. Is it fair to say this, that this is a totally uh, male-dominated world? Well, Middle Ages are a male-dominated world, I think, in that sense, yes. However, that doesn't mean that women are totally absent. Um, most notably, as great patrons, either alongside their husbands or sometimes individually with, uh, you know, uh, very important bequests. Of course, uh, we can't imagine, we shouldn't imagine a woman commanding a building site alone. This is all done through intermediaries, whether, you know, for men and for women. But certainly as patrons, they were very active. Um, there are also, I found evidence in my research in Central Europe that they quite often assisted their husbands uh, in, in the lower levels of trade and stone carters and so on, women could be involved in that too. Later on, we have evidence of them running the business side of things, of, 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 their, of their husband's lodges, or sometimes having to continue running them after they died in order to survive and to keep the you know, family together. So yes, uh, they were not totally absent, but they were not, uh, I don't think they were great master mason women in the Middle Ages that I've come across. Mm. And just to finish off, can you tell us what your favourite medieval building is, oh. if you could choose one? <laughs> That's a very difficult uh, question. Um, it's, it's very difficult to choose a favourite church because there are so many and they're really very, very individual. Um, I tend to uh, go for later medieval period, I have to say. Um, but I'm not going to totally uh, avoid the question, the answer, that is. Um, but I'm going to actually opt for a secular building rather than okay. a church. Okay. So one of my favorite buildings is the Vladislav Hall in Prague, uh, built by Benedict Reed um, around 1500 for another great ruler who was very briefly residing in Prague, Vladislav Jagiello. And uh, it's, a, it's a hall with a most uh, incredible uh, vault. So the whole building is basically a vault, but it's also built on the site of an older building of Charles IV. Uh, it's architecturally and visually stunning, um, and I think whoever goes and visits it, so if there haven't been sometime in the future, will agree that it's very, very unique. So I'll go with that. Yeah. Well, you should all go visit. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we'll finish there. Thank you so much for being here, Zoe, and for Thank chatting. Thank you for having me.